Again, I'm Jimmy Lamb from Sawgrass Technologies, and co-hosting with me is Colleen Hardigan from Madeira. Good morning, Colleen. How are you? I'm great. Good afternoon to you and to everyone out there, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope that we can uh, give you some great uh, ideas and examples of how to use multimedia, embroidery, transfer, uh, to help spark up your uh, embroidery presentations to your customers. So uh, I appreciate Jimmy organizing all of this and giving me an opportunity to be part of it. So thank you. Oh, well, you're welcome. Um, for any of you that joined us in the last go-around that we did a webinar, it was on basically the same subject. We talked about creative applique. And a lot of the feedback was, you know, can you show us a little more of the technique? And so that's what we're really going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit more about the actual techniques of being able to create on your own some interesting digital applique and multimedia so that um, you'll be able to, you know, do it instead of just think about it. Now, as we go through, when we start seeing the images of the process, keep in mind that I did it in the most simplistic way that I could using things like scissors, okay? And I know some of you have more sophisticated cutting systems, and that's fine. I just want to try and, and show it from the, the simplest you know, approach so that anybody can use the methodology that we'll be talking about today. Keep it simple, right, Jimmy? Absolutely. Keep it simple. So if you're an embroiderer, and you probably are if you're here today, uh, you already know that applique definitely has a lot of potential for you and your business and your designs. And, you know, typically applique has been something that's been referenced as a way to reduce stitch count. And I've always been concerned because I think applique is really more of an art form and it's great that we can reduce stitch count on very large designs. But by the same token, we really should approach applique for what it truly is, a very interesting artistic approach to embroidery and something we can use to add value to the things that we do rather than just reduce stitch count. Right, and we and we see a lot of uh, you know customer service uh, group is taking a lot of questions on how to do applique. Uh, they see it out there in the retail market, and uh, they're very interested in offering that to their clients. So uh, between the laser cutting, you know, the different ways to cut, and the different things that they're seeing in retail, uh, they want to be right on board and be able to offer these this type of uh, pr process to their uh, clients. So I, it's very, very uh, important right now that we talk about it and uh, give everybody as much education as possible. Absolutely. And what we're going to show you today is some really creative ways, very low cost, by the way, that you can get an edge on the competition when we actually integrate digital printing to be able to create your own fabrics with the applique process. Now, as you well know, with a traditional applique, and especially this is geared towards those who maybe haven't done applique yet. Um, if you look at the design on the left, you can see that it is pure stitching from one end to the other. It looks good, too, but there's a lot of stitch count in that particular design. Whereas the one on the right is the exact same design, but we've substituted fabric in place of the stitching. And the neat thing is the fabric's somewhat creative in my mind in the fact that instead of using a, a cheap cotton muslin or something, uh, denim was actually used over here. Uh, so there are some different types of fabrics, I believe this one was a suede and this one was a denim, that enhance the design that much more. Certainly reduces stitch count, but always keep in mind with applique, even though you're reducing stitch count, you are bringing in some extra cost in your materials um, and your process, so it's not quite as much of a super discounted format as you might think, but definitely to be able to produce it in a fraction of the time as all that stitch count, there definitely is some um, savings to be had there. But you can also increase the price of what you're charging so that the, the return on the investment that you're making in the fabric and, and the process actually will pay off for you. Yeah, and that's very true because the customer doesn't really care that it's got too many stitches in it and it's driving the right. price up. But when you're showing them something new and different and creative and a little bit more artistic, then in their mind they're buying and paying that higher price because they're getting something different instead of just pure stitching. Now, if you're 
doing applique production for the first time, you definitely want to consider a couple of things. The cost of the applique fabric, the um, cost of cutting the fabric, and the cost of applying the fabric. And those things go in. So if you actually traditionally price on stitch count, it's um, not the most effective way to do it for embroidery. In fact, excuse me, applique. In fact, when I do applique, I sit down and do a calculation of the time involved, and I really look at how many pieces can I do per hour and figure it that way, because I know I have some downtime as I go through the steps of um, doing embroidered applique. Okay, and again, if for those of you who are already doing applique, you know this, but I know some of you haven't done applique, so um, I just want to give you the basics on it, and then we're going to really move into the meat of it. So when we're doing applique, the first step in the process is that we sew the outline of the applique area, which is typically a running stitch. And in this case, you see an oval on the screen, and it's a running stitch, goes around, indicates where the fabric is going to go in the um, applique, and then we stop and apply the fabric using some form of adhesive. And, and that fabric is typically being cut out, whether by hand or by laser or by uh, a CAD cut system, so that it fits into that template or outline there that we have. And then our next step is after we've used some type of adhesive, whether it's a spray on uh, or some other products that Madeira has and that we'll, we'll see in a few minutes, uh, we're going to place it down and then we're going to sew what we call the tack down stitch and you can see on the screen now that the tack down stitch is just inside of the outline stitch so typically it's another running stitch it runs around the edge tacks it down in place uh, so that it's held firmly in place and then we typically put down our final border stitch now this particular border stitch I made it look like a zigzag it, it's a satin it would be you know, normally we do a nice closed in satin um, I just made it where it's kind of visible here to give it a clean finish so those are our three basic steps to be able to get that fabric in. And it's also very important, as you can see, we've sewn around the edges of the fabric. It's possible we're going to sew something across there. Maybe we're going to sew some text inside. But we want to make sure that that fabric does stay in place. And that's why we were using the adhesive uh, to actually help hold it in place while we're doing the tack down, and then to help permanently hold it in place once we're done. Now the, the the outline stitch is all digitized prior to uh, you know as part of this whole project. Yes. Okay. So that that they have to make sure that they have a design that is um, suitable for applique or is an applique design. Right. Absolutely. And, and you know you can take a lot of designs out there and easily convert them to applique using that three stitch process of an outline, a tack down, and then a border instead of a, a you know a big feel. You know, just taking any area. It can be any shape, size, or whatever, in theory. Right. And then the outline stitch, the tack down stitch, that's all done with uh, a matching embroidery thread so that all of the thing, uh, all of the stitching blends with the fabric and the rest of the design. Absolutely. That's a very good point. Um, you definitely don't want to use you know, contrasting uh, colors that might actually show up. Um, for example, let's say that the border stitch was going to be white thread, but you use black for your tack down, that black might actually show through that border stitch, and that wouldn't be ideal. Uh, you want it to be either the color of the fabric itself or the color of the border stitch as far as the outline and the tack down stitches are. One thing, too, I'll point out, just one of the little tricks for digitizing if it's your first time doing it. Um, it's normal that when we do the outline that we have it stop at the very top, not at the bottom. And there's a reason for that, because if you think of the position of the needles and the needle case, uh, the needles right now, once you, if it stopped right at that point, the needles, see where my mouse going back and forth, that's where the needles are located. Okay, that means we have easy access to this area to be able to put the fabric in. If we had it stopped down here, then that means we have to reach down and under the needles and we don't have a clear access. Now, some of you on your machines may have a feature where you're able to have the, uh, the pantograph move out for you to apply the applique fabric and then you can hit start and it goes back to where it was. It depends on your brand of machine as to whether you have that feature or not. But just for simplicity, always have it end at the top so that you can that easily access it. And that's important for the next step with the spray adhesive or whether you're using the 
a, a pre, you know, a, so that's a, so that their hands or the spray can get in there without right. uh, putting a coating on the machine. Absolutely, because you could have a, just a, a nice little square of cardboard, and you can slide it down uh, so it's blocking the head of the machine, and then do a quick little um, spurt there in that area, and it's not going to blow all up on the machine. Right. Some people actually will remove the hoop from the pantograph and carry it to the other side of the shop before they spray it. <laughs> so, yeah, I see lots of different ways of doing things. And then you don't have to use spray. There's other ways to adhere it, and uh, we'll talk about those as mm -hmm. we go. Okay. So embroidered applique, just as a quick reference, this is one that a lot of you know that I used to work uh, closely with Tajima, uh, still do, great company. And this is just a good design um, to reference because I set it up as a traditional uh, design and I set up as an applique. And if you look at the one on the left, that's pure stitching. It was about 19,000 stitches, okay? Uh, when I took out all that filled in area and did it as an applique, it reduced it to 11,000. So it took 8,000 stitches out of that design, but it did add more to the production time. And again, I always caution you, if you're pricing on stitch count only, it doesn't give you an accurate reflection of what goes into applique. So you could actually end up losing money. Yeah, you actually could. So yeah. when you're doing applique, you want to take a look at what's the time involved you know, to be able to do this. All the little factors and, of course, the cost of the materials. Okay, so that's basically in a nutshell how applique is done. It's a fairly simple process. Um, if you want more tips and tricks or detailed things, you know, I'll be glad to help you on that. I mean, one of the things, for example, is how do I create a template to cut out my fabric? And what we traditionally would do is take a manila folder, believe it or not, a manila folder, and tape it to an embroidery hoop, unthread a needle, and then just have it sew the um, outline stitch and we would sew right through that um, manila folder. Remember, we took the thread out, so all we're doing is putting holes in it. And so we have a perforated edge to show you the boundaries, Then we just cut out with scissors, and now I have a little cardboard template for marking my fabric. Okay, that's the real simplistic end. Um, if you have an, a CAD cut system and you set everything up with vector files, uh, it's, you know, you can just do it that traditional way. So I'm just telling you from the basis, very simplistic, but there's lots of other ways you can do it with it depending on the equipment that you have. But then I actually work for something that's you know a more complex um, applique uh, fabric if it were you know um, well all of them because it has to fit in that circle otherwise it's going to the fabric will come loose so it's important that the template be as exact yep. as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. I've seen okay. many appliques where Okay. Yep, I know. It didn't line up when we put down the tack down stitch and okay. Yeah. Yep, been there, done that. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, going beyond the whole stitch count thing, I mean, I'm really big on design enhancement because I think applique really has the ability to enhance a design, add more value, and more interest to it. You know, looking at this applique to start with, it's a fairly simple applique, but one of the neat things they did, if you look very close, I mean, the car. The applique is just the purple part of the car. Everything else is stitching. So it's a fairly simple applique as far as how appliques go. And, you know, in the production process, it's not all that complex of a shape, actually. You see a lot of extra embroidery details on top of it, but it's just one large purple shape, but it was brought to life with the extra details. But here's the other little trick that they used. When they did this, they actually put um, some material behind the applique fabric, kind of like uh, the batting that you might use uh, if you're a sewer, okay, to give it some bulk. And so that when it sewed around the edges, it kind of puffed up some in the middle, even using some adhesive to uphold it because of the batting material, they purposely got a bit of a puff up to give it a little bit more three-dimensional look in the end um, game. And, and I'm, I've always been impressed with that design because it's so simplistic yet really gives you a good um, idea of how artistic you can be with uh, applique. Do you think foam might work, if the, the, the one millimeter or two millimeter uh, foam? I think it would be fun system? to play with. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't tried that. I'm sure people out there have tried that and probably um, you know, have, have figured out the little tips and tricks of how to make that happen. But right. definitely I see potential on that. Uh, yeah. I think that the trick is, we just we probably want to secure the um, fabric to the foam and then the foam to, to the, the garment, yeah, to help so it doesn't shift in the, in the sewing process. Right. 
it's also, you know, it's an old trick to, is you, if you look very closely at the car, you'll notice that the border stitches were really wide satin. And by using that real wide satin, it helps you take into account any shifting that occurs that you didn't want it to with the fabric while you were sewing. Um, I'm always big on that margin of error. Okay. If only I could put a three inch wide satin. Okay. Maybe <laughs> not. Okay. Uh, I, you know, it's just a thought. Okay. It gives you a really wide margin of error. Okay. But, you know, just if you look at a couple of things we'll look at real quick on the, some of the creativity with applique, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to do a full satin, as I've been talking about with our um, final border there. This was actually done as a zigzag, and that's preferred many times when we're dealing with the athletic marketplace, and we're putting in tackle twill letters. Typically, you're going to put a, um, a zigzag rather than a, a true satin there, um, and that's fine as long as it's secured, and it's okay to embroider on top after you've already put the fabric down. That's a very common way to add to it as well. Yeah, here's just another creative use of fabric. The fabric's a little different. I mean, you know, my first applicators are just going and buying cheap fabric from Joanne's Fabric or wherever, you know, and putting it in there. And then I started seeing the beauty of using some unique fabrics that were more textured and whatnot or had different prints to give things a little bit more interest and excitement in an applique. Right, without doing embroidery or without having to do double applique or double right. layering. Right, right. Yeah, here's a prime example. It's sort of a, a shiny, blingy looking type of fabric that was used in the applique. Mm -hmm. So that and brings they, us, you go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 did they laser cut those? or Those were laser cut. cut those? those were laser cut. Yep. Okay. Right. Okay, so really where I want to kind of focus on the moving forward, that's just, you know, kind of a brief introduction there. But we're going to talk about a real project and how you can apply this into your business for doing digital applique. And, and the whole concept behind digital applique becomes with the systems of today and the new technologies, you can actually start creating your own fabric. And I ran into this for many years of not being able to find the right fabric because once I realized that unique prints and colors were important to the enhancement of the design, I started going on searches of really unique fabric, and it was very hard to find. You go down to the local fabric store, and what you might find, you never quite get the right thing, and then it's not there next month. It's there for a short period of time. So my wife and I went to fabric shows where we met manufacturers, but now we had to buy you know, a warehouse full of fabric. That's not going to work. So it was always kind of an issue. I mean, I remember quite a few years back, a very popular design for the schools was a three-letter applique that was like the three initials of the high school. And the applique, traditionally, what they were looking for was to have plaid fabric to make the applique that was in the school colors. Well, hello, where do you find the school colors in plaid? You know, consistently for all the different schools. And people were requested, and we couldn't deliver it unless we got lucky and we found sort of the right colors. So that was a challenge. Um, we did a lot of nautical appliques where as we found nautical looking fabric, that fabric was what really made the applique come to life. The applique itself was rather boring. But the printed fabric was pretty cool. But it was always that challenge. How do you get your own printed fabric? And now with all of our digital systems out there, make it yourself. I mean, that becomes the answer. You know, using the, the chromoblast system that, that Sawgrass offers and uh, Madeira sells, you can actually easily, in very small increments, create custom printed fabric for whatever job that you want. So suddenly you can do appliques that have the exact colors you need in the exact patterns that you need. And that makes it you know, really unique and exciting because it puts you a step ahead of the competition because now they can't go out and buy it because it isn't there. <laughs> you know, you created it yourself. You know, this is one of my favorites here, and this is the basis of the project we're going to walk through here in just a minute. Um, you can see the three-letter, probably a high school, and you see that it's in a polka dot pattern. you got the red po uh, fabric with the white polka dots. Where did you buy that? Well, it was probably custom-made. 
for the job. And that's what the digital processes can do for you. So let's talk about fabric printing with digital transfers. Now, if you know anything about modern digital transfers, uh, and I'm going to reference the Chroma Blast system since that's what we offer. And when I say system, what we actually produce is the ink. Okay, um, To be able to do a digital transfer, you're going to need a computer, which you probably already have, a graphics program, which you probably already have. You'll need a heat press, which you may or may not have, but a lot of you already do. And then finally, you need a printer that supports um, the ink sets. Okay, And in, in the case of what we manufacture at Sawgrass, uh, one of those printers, one you can see on the screen, is a Ricoh 3300. Now, this is an off-the-shelf inkjet style printer. We're not talking about you got to buy a $16,000 printer. We're talking about you know the printer by itself with no ink or anything retails for somewhere in the neighborhood of $250. Okay, that's exactly right. So, you know, so the point being is it doesn't cost you a whole lot of money. And then when you add in the complete inks to be able to outfit it to do digital transfers, it's going to add a few more hundred dollars to it, but. We're not talking about thousands of dollars here. We're talking about hundreds of dollars. Okay, hundreds of dollars still sounds like a lot of money, I know. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, what did you pay for your embroidery machine, okay, and compared to what did you pay for the ability to do digital transfers? So the process of doing a digital transfer is to set up your image using a computer and design software and create that image on screen, whatever that image may be. Okay, and you know, always keep in mind we got to have a good, high-quality image because garbage in it pulls garbage out. Uh, but typically, if you work with 350 DPI, that's a good setting. And always keep in mind 350 DPI um, at the size of the final print. If you're going to print something that's 12 inches by 12 inches. It needs to be 350 DPI at 12 inches by 12 inches. DPI is a whole lot like working with embroidery stitch files. If you take a DST file and you make it larger, it becomes really open looking. You have gaps because your density is decreased. Same thing with DPI. If you take a small image and make it larger, the DPI actually goes down and it starts to look pixelated and fuzzy. So always keep in mind that when you're talking about a DPI, you need to have that DPI at the size required for printing. Okay. So don't expect you can take a 3 inch by 3 inch image at 350 dpi and make it a 6 by 6 and it's still going to be 350 dpi. It's not. Okay, so we're going to print that out. Hey, you can hit a button, you're going to print, you're going to print through uh, your printer using the Chroma Blast ink onto transfer media. And then you're going to take that transfer media and you want to use good quality transfer media, not the home gonna, copy stuff. I was just going to make that point, right? Yep. Yeah. Don't want to use that's, that craft that's, that's store. That's critical in getting the results that you're looking for. Yes. Right? If you go down to Office Max and buy the Avery, you'll never get a good image. Trust me. Not going to happen because it's not commercial grade. Final step is we're going to combine that transfer with whatever we're decorating, in this case fabric, underneath the heat press and go to it. Now, the Chroma Blast inks that we're talking about today are designed for cotton, so they will work with any cotton-based fabric. Okay, that's all you got to do to make a digital transfer in case you didn't know. Okay, it's a, pr a pretty simple process. But now we're going to take that a step further and kind of bring it all into the whole applique concept, the whole concept of what digital applique is all about. Now, this is the project that I created. And if you've been in any of my seminars lately, you've probably seen this shirt. Um, the colors, by the way, on the screen are not so good. It just has to do with you know the camera and this, that, and the other. That's actually a pink shirt, though it looks almost like a melon colored on my screen. So um, trust me, it was pink. Um, and this is a real school, Laney High School. And the colors at Laney, blue and yellow, what gave that away. And the idea was to create a t-shirt focused on the female sector for spirit wear purposes. And so uh, we created this uh, three-letter applique, and we created the fabric using a digital transfer process specifically to match those school colors. Now, interestingly enough, I'm sitting here saying, well, how do I create a polka dot pattern? So I Googled it, and I found a neat little video that showed how to use Adobe Illustrator to create any kind of polka dot pattern that you want. And then it was just simply a matter of creating that pattern and the exact colors that I needed 
and then I just took a white piece of fabric, just a white piece of cotton fabric in this case, and um, used my chromoblast system and printed a large area on there with the polka dot pattern so that I transformed that white fabric into a piece of blue fabric with yellow polka dots. And not very pretty, you know, just hand cut the fabric and, you know, and uh, did the transfer. Uh, so it looked like this, okay? Might as well show you the actual steps. So I printed off a sheet. You can see up here in the top picture. Um, I printed off a sheet, a transfer paper that had the blue and the yellow polka dot pattern. And you can see in the background a wrinkled, nasty piece of white fabric. So I actually uh, hit it once with a heat press to get the wrinkles out. And then I went and applied the transfer onto that fabric. And it transferred you know, the colors and everything to the fabric. And then you pull that piece of paper off and throw it away. This is a permanent you know, ink transfer into the fabric. And you can see a little close-up of it. Um, I've now completely transformed the fabric to be what I need. You know, and I can do it in one quick shot, and I can save it in the memory. So I, every time I need to reproduce it, I can do it. Okay, I don't have to buy you know a whole bunch of bolts of fabric. There it is, simple. Okay. Right, and that eight and a half by eleven sheet is less than a dollar. Right. For that for that piece of fabric that matches exactly the the, the customer's request. Right. So that's you know, and then you probably you can get a, a lot of maybe one or two cuts, and this this is oh yeah, so those are very big. So, uh, so that that's a, that's a, a pretty low cost item to create a, a specific, um, you know, a specific color pattern that you're looking for. Right, and the neat thing about it is, you you can do just one, two, or three, you know, six, whatever. You you don't have to. You know, if you need to do a lot, then then you you can do this pretty fast because it takes about thirty seconds to print that sheet and then about a minute to transfer it onto the fabric. So, I mean, you can actually put the fabric out a lot faster. You can sew the applique. And um, the good thing is, is that it's it's also a very soft ink. So yes. the, it doesn't add a lot of bulk. I mean, we're going to do it as an applique. It's going to be on a T-shirt. You don't want something that's heavy and bulky. Right. So the 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 ink itself uh, permeates, and it, it it's a very soft, supple feel. Yep. So, which I think is important in this type of an application. Yep. Okay, so once I got the fabric done, the next thing I needed to do was I need I created just like I said. I did a very simplistic way um, of I created little cardboard. Uh, templates for the letters LHS, okay? Because I do it, I wanted to do it with scissors because I wanted to show you the most simple way you can do it. And I know if you have the CAD cut systems, if you have the laser, I mean, you can really shortcut some of this work, okay? Uh, but for those of you who don't have it, we want to show you that there are other ways to do it. So uh, using scissors and, and, and Sharpies, okay? Uh, one of the other things that I did here is it's very important. I don't really like the spray adhesive. Nothing against you guys here at Madeira, but you have another product that I like a lot better than the spray adhesives, which is this film that I used, if you want to tell everybody about the film. Right. We actually have um, uh, three types of film, but the one that has the double-sided glue is a Bemis heat seal material. Uh, and depending on the fabric you're using, this is a cotton, so we would suggest the higher temperature uh, uh, glue, which is the 4220. But if you were working more with a, a nylon or uh, a lighter weight, maybe lower melt fabric, then you would use the heat seal 5250. And this is a double-sided glue. So it adds stability to the letter so that you can cut them. So you would actually put the film on the 8.5 by 11 piece. Yes. Heat seal it to the back, which then gives you some rigidity in the fabric, so that when you go to cut your 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 letters, y y the fabric isn't moving. And then it's a double-sided glue that you'll use later on. Uh, you can to put it in place in the hoop, in the outline stitch that Jimmy talked about. Right. And one uh, interesting technical note on this: to make the chromoblast ink transfer using a heat press, you do it at 400 degrees. But when you're doing the heat seal material, it was at a lower temperature and it did not affect the ink. Okay, um, I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. I think it was 225 degrees or something. Um, and, and I'm just throwing that out there because I have it in my notes, but my notes aren't in front of me. Um, but the, the set temperature for that heat seal is lower 
than the temperature for doing transfers, which is good because that means that both of them work together and you don't affect the quality of the transfer when you're applying the heat seal. Right. So we put the heat seal onto the back, it just as Colleen said, to give, uh, make it a little bit more rigid. And also that becomes the basis of how I adhere the letters to the shirt during the actual production process. And then I cut the letters out. Okay, simple as that. I actually trace the letters, I know the old-fashioned way, and then I cut them out. So you can see in the right photo, there's the LHS. They're cut out, and they have the heat seal material already attached to them. So now we go over to the embroidery machine. And I know it, it, this is all the exact same shirt, but it was just the camera lighting and angles made the shirt look a different color in every picture. But trust me, it was all pink. Um, so you can see that the first step is we sewed the outline of the L. Okay, and then we stopped the machine, and we went and placed the first cutout on there, and we laid it down carefully. And then I took a clothes iron. Okay, and they also there's I, applique irons are available too. Uh, I actually used a clothes iron and just put it down on that L and just kind of just like almost like I was ironing the L, and it activated that heat seal on the back so that it adhered it to the shirt, and it was quick. Okay, right. I mean every bit as quick, if not quicker, than using the spray. But if you weren't working in a big hoop where you could actually get a, a you know, a home iron on there, yep. there are smaller, what that we sell, a smaller applique iron. Yeah, that much will better. That actually fit in a smaller hoop if you're doing a smaller, a smaller applique. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And app, I'm a big fan of the applique irons. When I was actually doing this, uh, and and the, where I was working, we didn't have one handy. So we did use mm -hmm. a big hoop and a clothes iron. It was very awkward. It just as you said, because it's big and bulky, you know. Right. And uh, the, actually, the applique iron can go down under the needle, the presser feet, to some exactly. degree, too. So that helps yeah. out a lot. So that's how we positioned it in. And then we did a um, tack down stitch. And then we did our final border stitch. And we ended up with our final. And that's a pretty decent shot. That gives you the real colorization. That was probably the best camera shot. Um, when we're all said and done, we have this nice three-letter applique in the exact school colors in the polka dot pattern that they wanted, okay, and I can alter that graphically at any time. At any time, I can go in the computer and change it and make another transfer real quick and then go put it in there, okay? Uh, and you can do anything you want in that. I mean, we've done them where we have the school mascots in sort of a repeating pattern, or maybe it's specific to a sport, so instead of polka dots, it's soccer balls or footballs, you know, especially when you're doing the soccer mom and the football mom kind of shirts, you know, you're using... Instead of doing a you know a big giant embroidered football, you're putting the school letters like that, but you're putting the football pattern applique in there, and then it says football mom at the bottom, you know. So I mean, it's kind of up to you. I mean, once you have that ability to do the digital, you can just do so many different things with applique. It's really cool. Right, and the great thing is is that we at Madeira here have uh, over 600 colors that you can match all of your fabric that you create too so you can coordinate the whole package so absolutely either blends like you did with the buccaneers here or is a contrast so yeah and it's the neatest thing about it is i mean yeah, i could pick up that cone of thread and then i could work with my digital you know program to to work on matching as close as i could to that thread and you know it might take you a little trial and error but i mean you'll be able to match that up so that you can really again customize everything from the thread to the fabric to everything that you need, you know, to have that turnkey job, and most importantly, you have something that your competition does, unless they're watching this uh, webinar too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that in. Okay, um, another variation is what I call digital multimedia, and uh, you know, it's it's kind of along the same lines, but we're combining a digital image and embroidery, but not as an applique per se. So a lot of the concept is still the same, except we're just not using applique. Um, you know, here is an example of actually the, the clothes on the clothesline were printed, and then there was embroidery like for the clothesline itself, and this is sequined. So I mean, that's that's a that's a digital multimedia kind of thing. But we're going to use one here since I live in Wrightsville Beach area, of North Carolina. Um, we're going to use sort of a beach kind of uh, thing, and the, I squinched this photo a little bit that. You know that that's from left to right for whatever reason, so it looks a little distorted. But you know, I'm not great with a camera. I'm not a push the button. 
So moving along from that, what we have here is we have a beach or a surf scene that combines a couple of different elements. Uh, we're going to use printing and we're going to use embroidery. And what we're doing here is the printing is dirt cheap. The embroidery is the expensive part, but yet it adds an extra little touch of pizzazz to the design. Okay. I didn't so know you had palm trees in Wrightsville Beach. We do. I have palm trees in my backyard. <laughs> oh, okay. Yep. I'll have to come visit. Uh, well, you know, I guess you, you really couldn't say they're naturally growing. We planted them, but they do right. grow, so they're sort of naturally growing, right? Okay, so, um, you know, the, the thing here is, well, let's back up for just a minute. The first thing to do is look at the artwork, and so what am I going to do with this artwork? Well, this is a standard piece of artwork that I got off the Internet, okay? And the, in, the actual original artwork, everything was printed. The palm trees were printed. The flowers were all printed. And what we did was, because we got it as a vector file off the Internet, we went and decided that the elements we wanted to embroider would be the palm trees and the flowers. And we did that for a couple of reasons. First of all, when you start combining embroidery and print, you've got to be very careful about how things line up. And you want to stay as far away from things having to critically line up as possible. Because it's very hard, especially if you're running a six-head machine, to consistently line the embroidery up exactly where it has to be in reference to the print. So we realized that if we took those elements and did them with embroidery, that they could shift around and we'd be okay. No one would notice. Now, also to make sure that no one would notice, the original artwork had the palm trees and the flowers. So what we did was we took the artwork and removed those elements out of the printed piece of artwork and then use them for the basis for the embroidery. That way the embroidery is not like covering a printed palm tree. Okay, There's nothing under the embroidery but the shirt. That's important to understand. So any shifting wasn't a big deal. Okay, so we took our artwork, prepared it first, and uh, have two files now. We have a print file and we have an embroidery file. And you work hand in hand on those so that they are in the right proportion. So again, we go and do our transfer. So we printed out our transfer, which was this right here, the Wrightsville Beach logo, on a piece of transfer paper using the Chroma Blast inks. And then we put it into the heat press, and we transferred the image physically over. And let me tell you, transfers from, from years past were you know, kind of have a bad name. But the reality is transfers of a day, digital transfers are a totally different ball game. And you got every bit as good a quality, if not better, is DTG. Because you're actually bonding these inks down into the fabric. This isn't a stick-on thing. That paper, i got to emphasize that, the paper is only a temporary carrier for the ink. Once you use the heat press, and you're finished with the heat press, you remove the paper, throw it away, and are left with that image. This is not a sticker, or it doesn't sit on the surface. It's down in the fabric itself. Okay. And the washability is also yes. uh, excellent. That, yes. uh, I think you should bring that out too because it's soft, it's penetrated the fabric and the washability, the colors stay very vibrant just the way it, it, you get with embroidery. It, 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 you don't lose the color wash after wash. So the integrity of the, of the design and uh, the garment is, is, is kept uh, Absolutely. through both. Yeah. And, and the steps are exactly the same as when we were doing that um, uh, applique fabric, except that we're, the fabric is the, the shirt in this case. So we went through the exact same transfer process, put that onto the shirt, and then we took the shirt and we hooped it. And um, Wow, look at those wrinkles, but we pulled some of that out. Uh, but we hooped it, and you can see right here there's no palm trees in the hoop, okay? because we're going to embroider those in. Uh, so then we went and lined it up, and we had pre-calculated that out as we set it up, and then we had it do the embroidery. And so it put down the flowers and the palm trees on top of the ink. And it has no problem penetrating the ink. The friction of the needles does not distort the ink or heat it up or anything like that. It's just a simple process to sew right on it. It doesn't gum up the needles, anything like that. It's just it's, it's easy to do. Quick and easy, and you're done. And you know what? If it shifts a little bit, nobody cares. That's the beauty of a design like this. And you always want to keep that in mind because it makes your production a lot easier. Now, I'm also, you know, somebody will point this out. I did this on a t-shirt in these examples. You know, the final product was actually a sweatshirt. This was like the first run. Um, because the reality is a t-shirt, people are only going to pay so much for a cotton t-shirt, you know. But if you put it on a sweatshirt, it becomes a viable product to have the embroidery with the uh, printing. If it's just going to be a, a plain t-shirt, 
he probably did nothing but just the printing and that's it. Right. Good point. Yeah, just that perceived value kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and, it, and the sweatshirt will support the whole, the whole. Uh, oh, absolutely! It supports right. it even a whole lot better, actually. Exactly. That's down to yeah. it. Okay, another one that I did uh, again back when I worked with uh, the folks at Hearst and Tajima. This is one that we did in a trade show out in California, obviously. But you know, and you see my fixation with surfing and all that kind of stuff, right? But whatever, I live on the coast. So this was another example of just showing you the combination of embroidery in digital printing okay and this was what the original artwork looked like the intent was the flowers all the floral would be embroidered along with the surfer and the other floral over here because the realization is if that embroidery shifts anywhere on top of that printed area it doesn't hurt anything if on the other hand the text was going to be embroidered if you had just the slightest miscalculation it would be obvious that it was off and we didn't want that yeah. Right, and not saleable. Absolutely. You, you want it to look creative, you want it to be exciting, and you want it to be easy. Okay? So, you know, this is what the actual embroidered aspect looks like. There's the embroidery, you know, all by itself uh, as the sew out of taking these pieces here, and that was going to be the embroidered. So all the printing is done, you know, it, of the background area. Now, also, we didn't cut out any of the printing behind the flowers. I mean, we, we printed this thing full-blown. Uh, we didn't print the flowers themselves, but I'm just saying that the circle and everything is complete, and then the embroidery lays on top of it, so the embroidery can shift anywhere you want. But keep in mind, you got this big coverage with printing, and then you're doing a smaller area with embroidery. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, the most expensive part you did with printing, which took you 30 seconds to do a transfer and a minute to put it on there with heat. Okay, so in a minute and a half, you did this big, giant print, which if you had to embroider that would have been, what, two hours? You know, so the biggest part of the design was printed and done very inexpensively, and then fine details were added with embroidery that took the value up without raising the cost too high. Right. Okay, well, that kind of wraps up what I wanted to show today. Um, just an example, a step-by-step -step example of uh, digital applique and also digital multimedia because, as we've been saying all along, using a system of, say, digital transfers with the Chroma Blast is a great, simple way for you to be able to print you know, on the different things. It does not work with darts. I'm sure I'm going to get asked that question. <clears throat> it does not have a white ink component. So... You know, it works best on white. I mean, it really and truly works best on white. And that can be somewhat limiting to some people. But when you look at the cost of the system and the ROI that you get, even just doing white garments, it's still huge because it opens up the doors for you um, very well. So, you know, just keep those things in mind when you start looking at what digital transfers are all about and what you can do with them. So I'm going to switch over to our question and answer mode. And by the way, I put our email addresses up here so that you can follow up with us later on any questions that you might have pertaining to this or anything else that we've been talking about today. But uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what our questions are and um, get you some answers. 